to Genesis chapter number 19. If you're not sure where that is, just open your Bible to about the 40th page. <laughs> it's right there in the front. My page is 24, actually. And I'm going to go to uh, verse number 17. Verse 17. And it came to pass when they had brought them forth abroad that he said, Escape for your life. Look not behind thee, neither stay thou in all the plain. Escape to the mountain, lest thou be consumed. Lot said unto them, O oh, not so, my Lord. Behold, now thy servant hath found grace in thy sight. Thou hast magnified thy mercy, which thou hast showed unto me in saving my life. And I cannot escape to the mountain, lest some evil take me and I die. Behold, now this city is near to flee unto, and it is a little one. Oh, let me escape hither. Is it not a little one, and my soul shall live? He said unto him, See, I have accepted thee concerning this thing also, that I will not overthrow this city for thou which thou hast spoken. Haste thee, escape thither, for I cannot do anything till thou become thither. Therefore the name of the city was called Zoar. The sun was risen upon the earth when Lot entered into Zoar. Then the Lord rained upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew those cities and all the plain and all the inhabitants of the cities and that which grew upon the ground. But his wife looked back from behind him and she became a pillar of salt. I want to preach for a few moments sitting in the gate, in the gate. Father, we bless you, we love you, and we thank you, Lord, for your goodness, your great mercies over us. Thank you, God, for all that you're doing. Thank you for healing in the house in Jesus' name. Let healing flow in the house in Jesus' mighty name. Touch your people, encourage them, strengthen them, and we'll give you praise in Jesus' name. And everybody in the house said amen and amen. Come on, let's bless the Lord and thank him. Oh, let's give him a good praise. According to the word of God, it is written that when two angels visiting Sodom at evening find Lot, who is sitting in the gate. We don't have the exact location. We assume, we take it that he's in the gate. We say that cautiously, but yet we find according to the word of God, he's not outside the city, he's not in the city. It's a very difficult place when you are a bystander, in Lot's case, a spectator. He was watching those in the city. He was also watching those coming into the city. Obviously, he saw people exiting the city through that gate. Gates are pretty important to us because we preach about them often. We talk about ear gates. We talk about eye gates. We talk about our sensory systems. Uh, men and women are built differently. We know that. God created a man first, and then he knew that the animals were not sufficient as helpmates. And there was nothing else there like him, so he took Adam put him to sleep, pulled a rib, which is where a woman should be, close to our heart, when God gives us a helpmate. And he created the woman. And Adam named her and called her woman. I always laugh a little bit and say, he probably said, whoa, man. <laughs> you get woman. <laughs> I think maybe we've just read it differently. <laughs> uh, sometimes I say, I got a whoa, man, hallelujah. <laughs> But the fact is, it's how God did it. It's how God created it. So we find here that he is sitting in the gate, which means he's not in, but he's not necessarily out. This is a good place to stop off and preach for a moment to talk to those of you, especially when we have been in prayer for Israel that has now retaliated against Iran. We both pray for Israel, we pray for Iran, because unbeknownst to a lot of people, there are believers both in Israel and there are believers in Iran, as much as in Pakistan, as much as in Afghanistan. In fact, it is the torture and the treachery that they live through and the mess that they have to withstand 
that the church is growing uh, exponentially, often in some of these areas that the Bible is not welcomed or permitted, and you can be killed for having just a piece or a partial page of it. This is what's happening. And so we find today that we are in a predicament here because as a pastor, my heart burdens for people that don't know the way. As we've heard statistics, we've heard these st statistics that 4,000 churches are started every year, but seven to 8,000 pastors quit every year. And I was telling my wife, we were talking uh, the other day, and I said, at some point, these numbers are going to uh, collide, and, and you're going to have more that's quit than what gets started if we're not careful. We're living in the perilous times that Paul talked to Timothy about, and we're in this place where uh, we have to spend a substantial amount of time telling people, you've got to get ready. You've got to get ready. Lot had to know you're either in this or you're out of this. You cannot live your daily life sitting on the fence. You are not built to straddle a fence. You are built to sit in a seat on one side or the other, not straddle the line. We'll either walk in the Spirit or we will fulfill the lusts of the flesh. And it is imperative that I preach this because it's unfortunate that this is where a lot of Christians are sitting, right in the gate instead of one side or the other. And we must be in a posture that's in or out. We're hot or cold. We're up or down. Or else God, as the scripture says in Revelation, will spew us out of his mouth. It's elementary when I say hot, cold, up or down, in or out, to most people that are in here. But there is a remnant of people that are in here that have to hear my heart in telling you, I promise you, this thing is going to wrap up before too long. China will not have the final say. America will not have the final say. Saudi Arabia will not have the final say. I don't care how much money they have. They will not have the final say. The billionaires of this world, of our country, and across our globe will not have the final say. They will not. My Bible says there is a lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world that will have the final say. And he's coming after a people without spot or blemish that are not sitting on fences. I say to our church, get on fire while you have the opportunity. I say while you have the opportunity, while you're sitting in church, to feel the tangible presence of his glory, to feel the goodness of God, that you feel something hit this atmosphere that I cannot create. It is the presence of God that blesses the power of fellowship, that where two or three agree on touching anything, or two or three on earth agree that I will be there in the midst of him. I'm telling you, we have an opportunity. We have it right now in 2024. Just about November is about to hit and saints of God I'm telling you if we are ever going to get our minds made up if we're ever going to step over if we're ever going to get committed if we're ever going to build our dedication on the foundation of this rock I will build my church Peter and the gates of hell shall not prevail it's now it's now it's now it's now Unfortunately, Lot had a commitment to both sides. He was neither committed to the city at this point or to the outside of the city. He was in the gate, which means his commitment was to both sides. And it cannot be that way. God is not going to be a side piece. And he will not treat his bride that way either. So from the pulpit to the pews to the parking lots, Tao to however far you make it in the building because there are people that will come to this church that will sit in the parking lot that don't feel worthy to come in the house. I'm preaching to all y'all, to everybody. Today is the day. These two angels approach the city and the Bible says that Lot is told to leave. Get your people. Get your family. You need to get out of here quickly because God's going to destroy it. 
When you read in Genesis chapter number 18, you will find there was a certain amount, a certain amount, a certain amount, and down to two. God, if there's righteous people, you'll see that conversation happen. And God continues to give grace. God continues to give grace. God has given grace to America. Very unfortunate things have happened in my 55 years of living. There are things that have happened that I never thought would happen. I remember 9-11. I remember when it happened as sure as I stand here. We never called for a prayer meeting. We never asked people to show up. We didn't have Facebook back then as I remember or social media in general. And I'm telling you, we opened our doors and people came off the road, off the highway, looking for places that had an altar where they could pray because it was humbling. And not just that, but the masses, the massive amounts of heartbreaking shootings that happen often over deranged individuals that really need Jesus. Over the innocent lives that are lost, not to mention innocent babies every day. The outbreak of COVID that shut an economy and that shut a country down that told us to separate, stay at home. And if you go out, we're gonna cover your face up so you can't talk, that you can't from the mouth where death and life come from is going to be covered and masked and we are gonna cut off communication and we're gonna keep you from breathing on everybody. Let's be real, now that we know that thing is over, some of those masks that you took your hands and touched something dirty and, and adjusted it became dirty right away. This airborne virus was not going to be contained. It was coming at us, hunting us like a lion would its prey. Saints of God, I'm telling you, only the hand of God has brought us to where we are right now. The grace of God is upon our country. I could continue to preach right here and talk about the grace of God. You just examine your personal life. You think about how really worthy you are. Things that you've done, things that you've said, things in private, you just can't seem to shake that. Things that, that, that come after you every day. I use the word haunting loosely because the enemy wants to haunt you every day. Not just past regrets, resumes, records, and stuff that you've done. And the fact that saints of God think about it, think about it. Oh, our righteousness, the Bible says, is this filthy rags. Saints of God, we are in trouble had it not been for the grace of God. Had it not been for the grace of God. Oh, I thank you, God, for the grace that you've given over our politicians in this country. Thank God for your grace. Thank God for preachers. I know no, we're not resilient. Sometimes we don't bounce back. Sometimes there are mistakes and things that we have done, but we need to pray for them. We, whether they've gone bad or whether they're doing all right, we need to pray for them. I've just got to tell you, thank God for the grace that is upon our country. Thank God that we're still aligned with Israel. Thank God we will keep them, bless them, hold them up, help them, pray for the peace of Jerusalem, but pray Pray that they will be saved. Saints of God, it's winding up quickly. You feel the spiritual warfare, both as you travel, in the air, on the ground, in traffic. You feel the spiritual warfare. You feel people that are absolutely all about themselves. You see it everywhere you go. If we are in a world where everybody's trying to step on somebody to get where they want to. Help us, God. Lot said, you got to go. Lot starts telling his family. They mock him. When he tells his family, his friends, God's going to destroy the city. Here's what's important. Here's where I'm going to do it. Here's how I'm going to do it. And what's important is that when you come out, don't look back. Man, can I preach that again? When you come out, don't look back. Genesis 19 and 17. And it came to pass when they brought them forth abroad that he said, Escape for thy life. 
Look not behind thee, neither stay thou in all the plain. Escape to the mountain, lest thou be consumed. Proverbs 14 and 14. The backslider in heart shall be filled with his own ways, and a good man shall be satisfied from himself. Luke 17, 31. In that day, he which shall be upon the housetop, and his stuff in the house, let him not come down to take it away. And he that is in the field, let him like nuts, not return back. Luke 17, 32. Remember Lot's wife. Luke 17, 32. Remember Lot's wife. Hebrews 10, 38, now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. I don't see how in the world we can blot out the word backslider in the Bible when I just gave you a few handful of verses that show us from examples in the Old Testament right up through to the book of Luke to Hebrews. It is evident there are many that have turned back and crucified him afresh. Luke 9, 62 said, And Jesus said unto him, No man, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. Any time that the enemy really comes to look for you, to find you and then communicate with you, it's always in a time where things can be negotiated. He waits until you're weak. He waits until you're accessible. He waits until you're vulnerable. And that's when he begins to speak to you. The negotiation and the bidding starts. I'll give you this. I'll give you this. If you'll take this. That's where it starts. The enemy always comes at you reminding you of what you had, but never reminds you of the repercussions of what you had when you had it. Always. The key is that we do not look back. Every time I get ready to do something that I feel is going to take a certain amount of faith and pressure, and people are watching me, I have to do it knowing. If you do this, you cannot look back. You cannot. You cannot. It is the toughest thing for a church to compromise because when you start to compromise the stage, when you start to compromise ministry, you cannot take that stuff back two months later. Because the Bible say that a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. There is instability and in being double-minded, which means a lot like Lot. I like the city, but I like outside the city as well. He had to have been there because he was sick of the sodomy that was going on inside that city. And I can give you verse after verse after verse that talks about a man being with a man and destroying the natural use of a woman. It is an abomination. Boy, I'm happy. I'm happy. I'm thankful I got some folks with me. Lot had to be at the place where he sat there and he looked out because he was sick and tired of what was going on in the city. But the problem is he wasn't being salt and light in the city because when he went to tell his family, they mocked him and said, you're crazy. So what had happened was they had compromised for so long that compromise became their comfort. And when compromise is your comfort, you won't change. You're not going to leave that. I'm going to stay right here. I like being stuck. There's a lot of people that won't get up because they're more comfortable being stuck. And you got to get to the place in your life where you say, I'm tired of being stuck. I got to do something and it's going to take a little bit of effort. It's going to say, we got to go. We got to get out of here. And some of you are going to have to grab your family, lay hands on your family and say, we are getting out of here. And before long, you'll know why. I'm 
I'm telling you, I'm telling you this morning when I woke up, my body would have loved to have stayed there another hour and a half. But my spirit said, get up. My spirit said, let's pray. My spirit said, let's get in the word. My spirit said, let's have communion together with God. Hallelujah. Saints of God, there's got to be something. There's got to be a turning point. There's got to be a crisis that hits enough so that we understand he's the Christ of it and that he's the only way through this and he's the only way we're going to make it. I know this sounds 1950s, 1970, 1990, and it's 2024. God has not changed according to the book of Hebrews. He's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. He's not compromised in heaven so we can feel good in the flesh. You cannot go forward looking back. There's no way. You can try it in the field when you get home. Go out in your front yard. Go ahead and turn around and look back and try to walk. And you're going to start going like this. Your body is going to take off and turn. It's impossible to go forward. Nothing is built like that. Reverse has one gear and one gear only. Going forward has four to three on a tree to eight to six to ten. Hallelujah. You're not built to go backward. Everything about you was built to launch forward. Everything about you spiritually, the, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down. You don't reach back trying to pull something down. You pull it down. In Ephesians, we have, we have the armor of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness. I've never found anything for the back. That's God's got your back when he puts you out front. Can I just tell you, God's got your back. I dare you to tell your neighbor that God's got your back. Woo, Jesus. The enemy breeds and feeds and lives off your past. Get into an argument with anybody and they will never bring up the great things that God's getting ready to do in your life. They will always take you back to 10 months ago. They will remind you of 20 years ago. They will remind you of 30 years ago. They will take you back to try to remind you of something that has happened because the enemy lives in the past. Come on, come on. Everybody touch your neighbor and say, the enemy lives in the past. And he's waiting to bring you back there to remind us of all of our mistakes, all of our hiccups, all of our mess ups. Come on, somebody. Help me, help me. Hey, 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 I'm up here in the middle. I'm right here. I'm talking to you. Everybody get your head back here. I'm right here. I'm not preaching over here. I'm over here. Come on. I said the enemy lives in your past. He lives in your past. And he's dangling all the mess ups you've had that cause you to hesitate. Oh, I don't know if I can do it. I'm a mess up. I'm a failure. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. One of the worst things you can do. Oh, help me, Jesus, right here. One of the worst things you can do is start listening to what you listened to before he brought you in. Because you know what that song will do? It'll drag you back to 1974. And everybody in this house has got to agree that in the 60s and 70s and 80s, we had the best music. I seen a 16-year-old kid the other day that had a Led Zeppelin shirt on. I couldn't stop. I couldn't help it. I had to say, you know who that is? Oh, it's my favorite music. I don't know how these new people are making it. Because all of these young people listen to our music when we were teenagers. Are y'all with me? And so what happens is, 
And what I had said was, he will take you back. Amen. And I know some of them are still touring. I was in a city not long ago where I went there to preach and I'm walking through the airport and I see that Morris Day is going to be singing the same area where I'm going to be preaching. And I said to myself, 777-9311. Oh, yeah. Some of you white people just going. I'm going to say something for you white folk. 8675309. Now all the white people know what I'm talking about. They getting up on stage just hobbling along. They way up in age. I'm saying that with all due respect. And they're trying to act like they still 18 and got a groove. Hallelujah. Y'all hear what I'm saying? Because they're trying to take about 5,000 people back to the day when you had it all together and had life by the tail. And now look at where you are. Y'all hear what I'm saying? You are where you are right now. You're not who you were then. Furthermore, you ought to stand up and say, thank God I've been delivered. Thank God I've been saved. Thank God I've been washed in the blood. Did I say all that right? Most difficulties stem from the past. If you are a married couple and one of you keeps bringing something up from 20 years ago and you're still together, shame on you. Stop it. If you stayed with him, if you stayed with her, that means you better quit bringing up what he did 20 years ago and it's a constant pick the scab pierce the skin, hurt him all over again, keep reminding them, stop it. Has he been forgiven or did Jesus leave something out of the sea of forgetfulness up on the beach for you to keep on picking up? Come on, somebody. Are you going to make it or are you going to make it? And the same thing with your relationship with God. Let it go. You cannot progress living in the past. (laughs) Hallelujah. Let me tell you why. He's constantly pulling you in the past because he sees your potential. That's all there is to it. I guarantee guarantee you, people that are running from God, that have zero Christianity, are never, never bombarded with the thoughts of yesteryear. They're just trying to survive day by day. But it's someone that has the potential to do something great for God that he's going to continue to pick and pick at where you've been. Let's stand together all over the church. Tap your neighbor on the shoulder. Say, neighbor, bless your heart. Please, please preach to them for me and say, if you've been forgiven, you are forgiven. Then tell your neighbor, stop fishing in the sea of forgetfulness for stuff that has been forgotten. Hold on one more time. You got to keep preaching. I'm not done. Tell your neighbor, I'm not done yet. Get off the fence. No, I meant that... I meant you to tell your neighbor that. Get off the fence. Get off the fence. God did not build you for the fence. Every head is bowed. Every eye is closed. God, thank you for your mercies. Thank you for your incredible grace. Father, I pray for your people today. God, give them strength. God, give them peace. God, give them help. Father, we love you, Lord. Father, we love you, Lord. Father, continue, Lord, to keep your hand upon us. 
Touch God, touch God, touch God, touch God. If there's anybody in here today that's not saved, or I'm not sure, Pastor, that's you. Maybe you were, maybe even been baptized, but just not where you should be, and it's been that way for a long time. You'd be a great candidate today to come to the altar again and just make certain that you make it right. If that's you, you feel like that, the Lord is speaking to you more than I am, and I know he is. Raise your hand and say, pray for me, Pastor. I know I need Jesus. Pray for me. Pray for me. Anyone in the house? Praise God. Praise God. Are there others? Come on, come on, come on. Anywhere in the house? Come on, Jesus. Come on, move God on your people. Move on your people. Move on your people. Move on your people. Thank you, Jesus. If that's you today, if you feel the tug and the pull from heaven, quickly come to this altar as soon as you can, as quick as you can. Come on, come on. The altar is open up. Thank you, Jesus. The altar is open up. It's always good to come back just to make sure. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Bless you, Joe. Thank you, Lord. Bless you, Joe. Bless you, Jesse. Thank you, Lord. Are there others? Are there others? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We're going to pray today. All of us are going to pray. All of us. Father in heaven, thank you, Jesus, for the precious blood that washes my sins away. Wash and cleanse and make me whole. Right now I'm saved, I'm washed, and I'm on my way to heaven. In the name of Jesus. And everybody said amen and amen. Now before we leave, everybody lay your hand on someone's shoulder. If you're comfortable, if not, just raise your hands. It's okay, either way. Praise God. Praise God. Let's all pray. God. Keep us off the fence. Keep us on fire, sanctified and holy. Meet for the master's use. Help me to be a blessing. Help me to be a sacrifice for other people to live and have joy in their going. Father, I bless you and I thank you in the name of Jesus. And let everybody in the house Shout amen and amen. Praise God.